Hello, welcome to lecture 22 of Electrical Circuits 1. In this lecture, we're going to still discuss second order system natural responses. Okay, we'll still have no source terms in our circuits. So the first little bit of time, we'll spend reviewing the basics of what we developed last time. We'll then go ahead and get a little bit more mathematical in terms of the solutions. We'll actually provide the solutions for the three different cases of underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped system responses. However, I'm not going to focus too much on the mathematics of those solutions. That's fairly tedious. What I'd rather do is qualitatively interpret what I would expect from my responses from those three types of circuits underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped circuits. We'll finally do a quick example where we do some circuit analysis, use some of these tools, and do a very small design-related problem with the same electrical circuit. The related educational material is in section 2.5.4 of the educational modules. In the last lecture, we looked at the natural response of second order systems. So the system is unforced, there is no forcing function. There is no external energy applied to the system. The system's response is entirely due to initial conditions. And we said that we will always write the governing differential equation in this form. We'll have a coefficient here that is 2 times squiggle times omega n, and a coefficient here that's omega n squared. And since it's unforced, the right hand side will always be 0. Now, squiggle is the damping ratio. Omega n is called the natural frequency. We started looking last time at how we can infer the system response from these parameters, which is the reason that we want to put the overall differential equation in this form. For the moment, I just want to point out that both the damping ratio and the natural frequency for any physical system of interest to us at the moment have to be bigger than 0. They are positive numbers. In the last lecture, we also looked at the overall form of the solution. If you recall, what we did was we assumed the solution was of some form e to the st, and we solved for the values of s that would satisfy the overall second order differential equation. We have two unknown constants, k1 and k2. Those constants need to be determined from initial conditions. For second order systems, typically those initial conditions are in the form of an initial value. So the value of the output at time t equals 0 has to be some number. And the slope at time t equals 0. So the rate of change with time of the output at time t equals 0 also has to be some number y prime sub 0. Now, a little bit of background information that we talked about last time as to the form of this solution. This term here, square root of squiggle squared minus 1, was kind of a problem child in that if squiggle is bigger than 1, we have no problems, okay? This becomes an e to some real number. This also becomes an e to some real number, okay? So what it looks like, the form of this solution, is two decaying exponentials with different time constants, okay? This one here will have a fairly long time constant, so it will decay slowly. This one here will have a short time constant. It will decay rapidly. The overall solution is the superposition of those two. However, if the damping ratio squiggle is less than 1, we have the square root of a negative number. This term here becomes imaginary, and we have a complex exponential. Now, we pointed out couple of lectures ago that complex exponentials look like oscillating functions. They look like sinusoids. So the overall form of the solution in the case of squiggle being less than 1 is of an exponentially decaying sinusoid. So we use squiggle now to categorize the system so that we know kind of what to expect from the system's response without having to determine k1 and k2. Okay, we don't need to actually solve for y sub h of t in order to get a feeling for how the system's going to respond. So let's take a look at the categorization of these types of systems. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, systems are often classified by their damping ratio. Okay, this is important. Okay, it's worthwhile going over again. It's worthwhile remembering. 
If the damping ratio is greater than one, the system is said to be overdamped. That's the case where I mentioned that the response has two time constants, and the overall response may decay very slowly, especially if the damping ratio is very large. In the case where the damping ratio is exactly one, the system is said to be critically damped. If you look at the form of the solution, which we will later on, there is only one exponential term in there. You have only a single time constant. Okay, this particular case will decay more quickly than any overdamped system response. Finally, for the case where the damping ratio is less than one, the system is said to be underdamped, the response can oscillate. Okay, it will have sinusoidal terms in it. This oscillation, as we saw before, is based on the damped natural frequency. Omega sub d is the natural frequency, omega sub n, times the square root of 1 minus squiggle squared. Okay, so these oscillatory terms in here are going to have frequencies that are associated with this term here. Okay, now I want to provide the mathematical expressions for the system response for the three different damping cases. For the overdamped system, my solution takes this form. Okay? My initial slope, y prime sub zero, is here. My initial value, y sub zero, is here. They show up here and here. So I've left y prime sub zero and y sub zero inside my expressions for k1 and k2. Okay, so I've solved for k1 and k2 using my initial conditions. The important thing about this solution is that I'm taking a decaying exponential here, multiplying it by a growing exponential here. The combination of these two is going to decay exponentially, but possibly slowly if the damping ratio is large. Alternately, I have in this term a decaying exponential multiplied by another decaying exponential term. These combinations are going to decay rapidly relative to these two terms. So this guy here in conjunction with this and this guy here in conjunction with this give me two decaying exponentials which decay at different rates. It's like a system with two time constants. Okay? Now, this particular mathematical expression is of very little interest to me. Okay? What I really want to get to here is a qualitative interpretation of what this means, rather than actually labor through all this mathematics. This is fairly tedious to come by. Okay? You probably don't want to solve a second order differential equation with general initial conditions. So in the next slide, I'm going to try to take a look at what happens to this term as I change my damping ratio. Now I want to look at a graphical representation of that previous mathematical expression to see if we can get some qualitative idea of what happens to the overdamped system's response as the damping ratio changes. Okay? As I said before, the response contains two decaying exponentials. They have two different time constants. And in fact, here is a response for a fairly high damping ratio. I've given this a significant initial slope, so y prime of zero is some fairly large negative number, and I have an initial value y sub zero. You can easily see from this that we're decaying at some rate. Okay, there's my quickly decaying exponential, and then there's a slowly decaying exponential that persists for a long, long time. So this response is decaying very slowly. Okay? So this is for a fairly high damping ratio. It takes us a long time to get down to zero response. As we decrease the damping ratio, the response dies out more rapidly. So for a slightly lower damping ratio, we still have the apparent two different time constants. Now we're starting to see these time constants becoming closer and closer to one another so that the faster time constant persists for longer and the system's response is dying out more rapidly overall. As I keep decreasing the damping ratio, 
Okay, this is still an overdamped system. Now we're starting to lose track of the fact that we have two different time constants. For fairly low damping ratios, not much more than one, the time constants are very close to one another, and it almost looks like a single decaying exponential. Okay? That's the kind of idea, the kind of qualitative notion that I want to have about the response so that I can categorize the response and visualize this without having to solve the mathematics to obtain the solution as a function of time. For a critically damped system, with the damping ratio identically equal to 1, my response is fairly amenable. Okay? I have a single exponential term. I have a constant here, which is one of my initial conditions. And then I have this term here, which is actually growing linearly with time. Okay? Things that grow linearly grow much less quickly than an exponential decay. So this overall solution is going to decay more or less exponentially. There is only a single time constant here. We don't have multiple exponentials. Okay? Since this is not a growing exponential, since it's growing linearly, this response will die out more rapidly than any overdamped system response. For example, I'm going to replicate the previous slide that I ended up with for my overdamped system. So this is for a high damping ratio, and I'm gradually reducing the damping ratio. When I get to a damping ratio of 1, my response for this same set of initial conditions looks like this. Okay? It's coming down really quickly, and it's approaching 0 faster even than this one. This has a fairly small damping ratio, even though it is slightly more than 1. Okay? One thing I want to point out here, okay, I said that overdamped systems and critically damped systems do not oscillate with time. Okay? They can cross the zero axis once. Okay? You're allowed one zero axis crossing and then coming back up to zero. That does not count as an oscillation. In order for this system response to be classified as oscillating, it would have to go back above here and have some sort of sinusoidal behavior. And in fact, this zero axis crossing is directly due to the large initial slope that I put on this as an initial condition. Now finally, let's look at the underdamped system natural response. If the damping ratio is less than 1, the solution looks like this. I have a decaying exponential that is multiplied by some combination of sines and cosines. So I have these sinusoids that are multiplied by a decaying exponential, so the overall solution is going to look like some exponentially decaying sinusoid. Notice the frequency of these sinusoids. Time multiplies omega n times the square root of 1 minus squiggle squared. This omega n times square root of 1 minus squiggled squared is the damped natural frequency omega sub d. So when we look at this response, we should be able to see something very close to the damped natural frequency in the solution. Okay, let's take a look at what this solution looks like graphically. Okay? As I said earlier, the response consists of exponentially decaying sinusoids. If I take a look at that response for a relatively high value of damping ratio, something you know, up close to a half or 0.6, I have an oscillating response. Notice that this comes back above the y equals 0 point. So I have an oscillation in this signal. It's dying out relatively quickly. Okay, So this is for a relatively high damping ratio. If I reduce the damping ratio, the overshoot becomes larger and larger, and this decay becomes longer and longer. Okay, So for a lower value of damping ratio, I'm going to get more overshoot. The envelope here is essentially this e to the minus squiggle omega nt. So as squiggle becomes larger and larger, this decaying envelope becomes sharper and sharper, and you damp out your oscillations more and more rapidly. Now let's take a quick look at an example which might illustrate how these concepts can be used.
I have this circuit. It has an inductor, a capacitor, and two resistors. The resistors have the same resistance value, R. I want to find first the equation governing the voltage across the capacitor. I want to find the natural frequency, the damp natural frequency, and the damping ratio under certain circumstances. Okay. I want to find out whether the system with these values are under, over, or critically damped. I'm going to slip in a little design problem here. Somebody has told me that I get to choose the resistance values for this circuit. L is 1 Henry and C is 1 microfarad, but we can adjust R. I'm going to adjust R so that the system is critically damped. Okay? Finally, if I'm given initial voltages across the capacitor, V sub C at T equals 0 minus, and the initial current through the inductor, I sub L at 0 minus, I want to find the initial conditions on this differential equation that I found in part 1. Okay. Remember that my initial conditions, I'm going to want Vc of t at t equals 0 plus, and the rate of change with time, dVc by dt at t equals 0 plus. Okay. So I'll use these conditions to determine the initial conditions on Vc and dVc dt. Okay. So I'll go ahead and do each of these parts of this problem on subsequent slides. Okay, for part one, I want to find the overall differential equation governing V sub C of T. I have two energy storage elements. I can't combine a capacitor and an inductor, so they have to be independent. So the overall differential equation governing this circuit is going to be second order. There are no sources in this circuit, so the differential equation is going to be homogeneous, and I will be characterizing a circuit's natural response. Now, we saw a circuit that was almost indistinguishable from this one back when we introduced second order circuits. We had a series RLC circuit. This looks the same except that I've divided the resistors into two so that I have a total resistance of two times R. When I did that series circuit, I just did KVL around a single loop and I came up with an integral differential equation. I had a first order derivative term in the equation and an integral term in the equation. I then differentiated that equation in order to get a second order differential equation. I mentioned at the time that I didn't like that approach. I like writing differential equations. I don't like writing equations that have integrals in them. So I'm going to use a different approach here. I'm going to write multiple equations, all of which are differential equations. Then I will combine those equations to get my desired second order equation in V sub C of T. Okay. Now, the first step I recommend that you do is to go ahead and label the current through the capacitor and the voltage across the inductor. Now, I also said previously that I will always choose capacitor voltages and inductor currents as my unknowns. Okay, so when I write equations, I'll write these in terms of V sub C of T and I sub L of T. When I combine these equations, I'll get rid of the variable I don't want to get a second order equation just in V sub C of T. Okay, so let me label the capacitor current. If this is the capacitor voltage, my current through the capacitor has to be positive into the positive voltage node. That is C times dVc by dt. Similarly, for the inductor voltage, if my inductor current is assumed to be going downwards, my higher voltage node has to be at the upper node. V sub L is equal to L dIL by dt. Okay, That saved me from having to remember some stuff later on. I can see what my appropriate voltage polarities are. I can see the expression for my voltages. I can see my appropriate current directions without thinking about what polarity this voltage has. Okay, Now I'm going to write KVL and KCL until I get enough independent equations to find a second order differential equation. Let me demonstrate. If I do KCL here, KCL tells me that I sub L plus I sub C is equal to zero. So I sub L plus 
c dvc by dt is equal to zero. That's a perfectly good equation. I didn't violate any rules creating it. Unfortunately, it is one equation with two unknowns. I need another equation to get two equations and two unknowns in order to be able to solve this system. The rules are the same as for algebraic equations. In order to get a unique solution, you need the same number of equations as unknowns. Now, to get my no another equation, let me do KVL around this single loop. KVL, if I start down here, okay, this voltage difference here is R times I sub L. This voltage difference here is R times I sub C. So coming into this node, I get a minus R I L minus V sub L, which is just L D I L by D T plus V sub C plus R times I sub C, which is just C dVC by dT, is equal to zero. Okay. Now let me simplify this one a little bit on the next slide. On the previous slide, we wrote two differential equations in two unknowns, which described the current through the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor. Now what I want to do is combine these equations to eliminate the inductor current in favor of the capacitor voltage, which will leave me with a second order differential equation in the capacitor voltage. First, let me rearrange this equation. If I rewrite this, I can find that I sub L is equal to minus C dVC by dT. This term can now be plugged in for this I sub L. I also need to eliminate dIL by dt, so if I differentiate this with respect to time, I get dIL by dt is equal to minus C d squared Vc by dt squared. So this term goes in for this one, so I end up with a minus R times I sub L, which is minus C dBc by dt, minus L times this one, which is a minus C d squared VC by dt squared, plus VC plus RC times dVC by dt is all equal to zero. Now I can combine this term and this term, minus R times minus C is plus RC, so this combined with this becomes a positive 2RC. This minus L times minus C is a plus LC, so I get an LC times D squared VC by DT squared plus 2RC times DVC by DT plus V sub C is equal to zero. Now my standard form of my differential equation has a one multiplying the highest order derivative. That will allow me to determine what two squiggle omega n and omega n squared are. So I'm going to take this equation and divide through by LC, which gives me d squared VC by dt squared plus 2 R over L. This C cancels with that C times dVC by dt plus 1 over LC times V sub C is equal to 0. This is the governing second order differential equation for the circuit that I'm examining. OK, now I'd like to determine the natural frequency, the damped natural frequency, and the damping ratio for this system. If the inductance is 1 Henry, the resistance is 200 ohms, and the capacitance is 1 microfarad. Okay, This is easiest to do if we look at this equation as being in its natural form. Previously, we determined the governing differential equation for V sub C of T to be this. This is of the same form as our standard equation, which was d squared y dt squared plus 2 squiggle omega n dy by dt plus omega n squared y is equal to 0. So equating coefficients, 2r over l is equal to 2 squiggle omega n.
If r is 200 and l is 1, this is 400. Therefore, squiggle times omega n is 200. Likewise, our other coefficient, 1 over lc is equal to omega n squared. L is 1, C is 1 microfarad, so this is 1 over 1 Henry times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads is equal to 1 times 10 to the 6th. So omega n squared is 1 times 10 to the 6th. The square root of that is omega n is 1,000. That result is in radians per second. Do not interpret that to be in hertz. I will convert it to hertz, however. So Fn is approximately 160 hertz. Because I'm going to graph these results later, and I want to show where the frequencies show up on the response curves. So if omega n is 1,000, squiggle omega n is 200. So Squiggle is 200 over 1,000, or 0 0.2. So we've got the damping ratio. We've got the natural frequency. We now need the damped natural frequency. Omega sub d is omega sub n times the square root of 1 minus squiggle squared, which is equal to 1,000 times the square root of 1 minus 0 0.2 squared in radians. So the damped frequency, if I convert it to hertz, because I'm going to want to look at this graphically later on, is about 155 hertz. Okay. Notice that this low value of damping ratio has not changed my damped natural frequency much from my natural frequency. Okay, now I want to characterize this system as being either under, over, or critically damped. In the last part, we found that the damping ratio is 0.2. If the damping ratio is less than 1, the system is under damped. Okay, recall that we had exponential terms which had omega n square root of squiggle squared minus 1 times t in them previously. So now this is imaginary. We will expect oscillations in this output. And maybe I'm not very happy about having oscillations in the response, but for whatever reason, I want to pick a new value for those two resistors, R, so that the system is now critically damped. Okay? We haven't said anything about wanting to change the natural frequency, so I'm going to keep my natural frequency at 1,000 radians per second. Okay? I want to emphasize that I'm not using hertz to do any of my calculations with. I always do calculations based on radians per second. When I look at my graph, then it becomes convenient to look at units of hertz. If I want the system to be critically damped, the damping ratio is equal to 1. Therefore, 2 times squiggle times omega n is equal to 2,000. In our previous expression, 2r over l was equal to 2 squiggle omega n. Okay? So now we know that l is still 1, milli, 1 henry, so 2r is equal to 2,000. So r is equal to 1,000 ohms will give me a damping ratio of 1 so that the system will be critically damped. Now we want to determine the initial conditions necessary to solve the previous equation. Okay, we're given that V sub C just before I start my simulation is going to be 1 volt, and the current through the inductor just before T equals 0 is 0 0.01 amps. I can use these to determine the initial conditions on my second order differential equation. What I need is V sub C at t equals 0 plus, 
okay, the initial value of the voltage across the capacitor, luckily we know that voltages across the capacitor cannot change suddenly. So the voltage across the capacitor at zero plus has to be the same as V sub C at zero minus, which is just one volt. We've got our first initial condition. However, we also need the rate of change of V sub C of T with respect to time at T equals zero plus we are not quite sure what that's going to be. Okay? However, we have another condition that we haven't used here. Okay? We have the inductor current. We know if we're given this that I sub L at zero plus is equal to 0 0.01 amps because I also cannot change the current through an inductor abruptly. We also know that I sub L of T is equal to minus C dVC by dT. This was previously given to us by KCL at the upper node. When we were writing the overall second order differential equation that governed this circuit, this was one of the two equations that we wrote. Therefore, dVC by dT is equal to minus 1 over C times I sub L, so dVC by dT at T equals 0 plus is equal to minus 1 over C I sub L at time T equals 0 plus. That's just 0 0.01 amps, so this is minus 1 over 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times 0 0.01, which is just equal to minus 10,000 volts per second. Okay, We've got our two initial conditions that we would need to solve these equations. Okay, we've got the second order differential equation governing the system and the two initial conditions that we need to solve for the response. It turns out that with R equal 100 ohms, this is the system's response. We do see the overshoot that we expected from the damping ratio being 0 0.2 and there being an underdamped system involved. This is my one volt initial condition. This initial slope is my minus 10,000 volts per second. We actually get down to about minus 8 volts here. We're seeing a lot of voltage relative to the initial voltage that's in that capacitor. Likewise, this period here, T is, e is approximately equal to 1 over the damped frequency. So this is about equal to my 1 over 155 hertz. If I had a time scale on here, I would see a number that's associated with this as being the distance between peaks on this signal. Okay, so the damping ratio allowed us to identify that there will be oscillations in the response. The damp natural frequency gives us an idea as to what the period of the resulting signal is. Now we redesigned this system so that the system was critically damped. If I re-simulate the system's response for that value, I end up with this curve when R is equal to 1,000 ohms. So this is the critically damped case. Okay, the system settles to its final value much more rapidly. We don't see nearly the excursions in voltage that we had before. There are some advantages to this. Okay? Just for fun, I also went ahead and created an overdamped system response. This one is for a resistor value of 3,000 ohms. You can see that once it's overdamped, we're squelching out these oscillations or these excursions even more, but it's taking a long, long time for this system's response to decay to zero, just like we'd expect from our previous discussions relative to underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped systems. This concludes my discussion of the natural response of second order systems. Next time we'll 
come back to second order systems, but we'll be talking about the forced response and specifically the step response of second order systems. We'll also get a little bit more quantitative about the system response. For example, with the natural response, we just said that if it's under damped, there will be oscillations in the result. When we do the step response, we'll go ahead and try to get a feeling as to what the magnitude of those oscillations are. Okay, so we'll assign a few more numbers to our response when we get to step responses. We'll also do more examples of actually creating the differential equations that govern second order systems next time around.